You had a, a really interesting, wonderful conversation with Jordan Peterson earlier this year. Uh, and a lot of people, like the, I read the comments and a lot of people fa thought it was one of his best conversations, seeing that you really sparked off each other and... and yes, um, I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk more about that? He came from the now famous interview with Kathy Newman on Channel 4, so he was quite, you know, wired. Um, he arrived extremely late and he had half an hour between then and going to Paris. We had had, we'd never met one another. Um, I knew actually very little about Jordan Peterson's written work. He knew pretty little about mine. And we were just told, sit down and shoot. And we had no idea where we were going. So he just started talking. So why the master in his emissary? And it just went from there. But what I felt was, here was you know, a super intelligent man who had wide-ranging interests in psychology, philosophy, and didn't rule out a spiritual angle to things. Um, and I, I don't think that I would, and, and in the film, I, in that clip, I think it probably comes out that there are aspects of what Jordan was saying that I was going, well, yes, but. So I don't entirely kind of, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a, a, a Peter, Petersonian, but I do have huge respect for him. And we had a, a great conversation, and we we're proposing to do um, more. Yeah, I mean, one of the most common comments was, where's the rest of this interview? Can we have more? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, uh, actually, I just, uh, he's been uh, fabulously busy in the last year, and uh, I had to email him about something else, uh, actually, just yesterday, and he wrote back saying, um, uh, top of my list for when I begin again doing a podcast in the new year is to do one with you. Listening to it, it was very interesting, especially as you, hadn't, you weren't that aware of each other's work, how it seemed that your theories mapped onto something he talks about a lot, which is the balance of order and chaos, and the known versus the unknown. Is that a right brain, left brain phenomena? No. Is um, there a parallel? Uh, not much. Uh, there is a bit. I mean, first of all, uh, I'm sorry, I don't accept his order is male and chaos is female. Uh, I don't even understand that. Um, I do accept that the left hemisphere, which is not what he's talking about, is concerned above all with consistency. So, um, and that's why it over relies on systems, procedures, algorithms that produce results that are consistent with everything else it knows. The right hemisphere is open to everything, as it were, without prejudice. And it therefore sees that there are many things that actually don't, don't do that. Now, in the left hemisphere, those just get ruled out. And I think that's where we're at intellectually. We have a system that is self-consistent, that keeps on getting rolled out, and everybody can't see, well, not everybody, but many people cannot see a way out of this. Because, because actually, once you're inside this hall of mirrors, as I call it, you can't see the chinks where you can sort of get out. What I think Jordan Peterson is doing is um, he has enormous uh, rhetorical strength. And he's really you know, allowing people to, to see that there are things that, is not, that are not included in this model. And I'm hoping that I, in a perhaps... Um, in a different way, uh, I'm doing the same thing. Um, if you like, I did say to him, you seem very keen on order, which might exclude chaos, but chaos is like the sort of grit in the oyster shell. There is a need for this resistance. This is a theme that is very important in the book I'm now writing, which is that nothing comes into being or can be without resistance. Um, a sim simple way of, of thinking about it is that actually uh, we can't move if it were not for friction. Friction is actually stopping you moving, but actually moving depends on friction. Uh, a more sophisticated one is to do with the nature of flow, which is the overarching metaphor of flow as what it is, what the universe is. Uh, you know, Heraclitus is saying everything flows, this is brilliant. He didn't say everything changes, he said everything flows, which is a different matter. But anyway, flow produces something very important. It produces irregularities, 
and it only actually exists if there is a degree of containment. So if water, if, if there is no containment, water is still and does nothing. It's the containment that causes the flow, and it's obstructions to the flow that cause turbulence. And turbulence is massively creative. All flow in nature is turbulent, or at least almost all that flow in, in nature is turbulent. And turbulence is one of the last things that we can map. We know how um, we, we, we can, we're getting to grip, we don't really know, but we're getting to grips better with quantum mechanics than we are with the, the mathematical equations for flow. They're so complex and they're, they're almost infinitely complex that it is said that we can never actually do it. So they might be an instance of a kind of chaos that is vastly creative, partly because it's the coming together of order with disorder. And I'm always saying we need division and we need union. It's not just that union is marvellous, all is one, and that's the perfectly wise point of view. It's not that everything is separate and distinct and atomistic. We need to bring these two apparently opposite points of view together. We need union and division, but we need, at a meta level, union of them, not the division of them, which is what we now have. So that is imaged in this business of water. And let me just give you a, 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 something that, that might strike um, viewers. If you take an entirely straight-sided pipe and you put water, run water through it at such a speed that it can run smoothly, and you then place at right angles, perpendicular to the flow, an entirely straight metal bar that doesn't block the flow, what you get, what do you think you get? You get something unimaginable that is both orderly and beautiful and nothing like the rectilinearity of it. You get something called a Kármán Street vortex, which is a series of interlocking flows that have clear structure, but are also unmappable and, and endlessly variable. So out of this unpromising conjunction of rectilinear, unitary things comes this multifarious um, creative beauty. That is, I think, a lovely image for me. So I remember in the interview you asked, you asked that question about that he was a little bit more suspicious of chaos than, mm. than you were. Mm. And it, his answer was that he, he thought it was right to put yourself on the right border between order and chaos. Yes, which is where we came together. Yes. And he acknowledged that there needs to be this, this coming together of order and chaos. So I, I don't think we're apart on this. It was just a difference of emphasis because whatever um, else, it seemed from what he'd just been saying in the conversation that he, I mean, after all, famously, he said, get your room in order, which I'm in favour of. Um, I'm also in favour of a slight element of disorder in the order. And indeed, the, the art of beauty is uniting order with disorder, pattern with things that can't be mapped. And... What do you make of the sort of the criticisms? Because often he's described as a fraud or a charlatan in some of the, the media coverage. But when you watch the interview with yourself, I mean, that's, that's a very high level conversation. The idea of him as a fraud or a charlatan just seems kind of well, bizarre. It's, it's outrageous. It's, um, it's disrespectful. It's dismissive. And it's entirely typical of blinkered liberalism. He, you, you can disagree with him about many things, and I would disagree with him about a number of things. But to say that is just to show how blinkered you are. He, he's clearly an extraordinary man, and I, I didn't want, how dare they call him a charlatan? What does that mean? I think what strikes people is that he was relatively unknown and then he became known. But that's what life is, and it doesn't prove you're a charlatan. Yeah, maybe some jealousy. But, I mean, what, what's interesting for me as someone who I went out to interview him mm. in October last year. Oh, did you? And as soon as, mm. yeah, before, well before the Kathy Newman interview. Yes. And my immediate, as soon as I saw a couple of his lectures, I thought, this is, a, this is the important piece that we're missing in our culture right now. Yeah. So none of, like, his, his, mm. his meteoric success since then mm. has been no surprise to me because I thought... Not to me. And also I find it very... 
interesting that in this very new atheist kind of dominated world, yes. suddenly we have a man talking about religious experience and spiritual yes. experience yes. as one of the most yes. famous academics in the world. Yes. How significant do you think that aspect is? I think is? it is very significant. Um, I, 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 my myself probably prefer a more, you might call it mystical um, approach to religion. Uh, than, than Jordan, although I wouldn't want to, you know, narrow down, I, I don't know him and his views well enough to, but I, I, I sense that I, the things that really interest me in the spiritual tradition are Taoism, Zen, Sufism, um, the medieval mystics, Meister Eckhart, the author of The Cloud of Unknowing, um, you know, Jakob Burma, you, you, you know the, the score. Um, and these people seem to me to be expressing very profound truths. And indeed, in that talk with um, Jordan, I brought up the Lurianic Kabbalah, which is something I came to only about four or five years ago, but which is, seems to me absolutely packed with, <laughs> with the most vivid insights in, into the nature of things, which, which illuminate um, the, the right left hemisphere thing that I've been talking about. I just couldn't believe it that it, there it was in 1600 and something, people intuiting this. You see, this is the thing. I think people have an intuitive knowledge that their, their mind is actually not unitary, that there are different aspects to it that have differently valid ways of thinking, but that the culture forces you to espouse one point of view. One of the values of having a religious culture is that it allows you to espouse what well, first of all it instills humility which is no bad thing it seems to me simply a failure of intellect to believe your intellect is so powerful that it knows everything or even could um, so uh, no doubt in evolution is an ongoing process we don't, I mean a mouse might think it knows everything but whatever it comes after us may look back on us and think with their poor little brains so the sheer arrogance of we can understand it all is breathtaking. So one thing, good thing about religion is it instills a sense of, of you know, limits and humility, which I think are very good. It, it embodies, um, I mean, this is old, old hat, but it, it embodies certain kinds of moral principle, which, of course, it's not necessary to, an atheist can be a very moral person, but it's actually quite useful in a culture to have norms against which to judge things. At the moment, the norms are those of me and what I need and so on, which are not so good. It's, we've simply traded down. You referred to it just then about the, the idea of the left brain as a hall of mirrors. Yes. And I think this is in your RSA animation as well, the idea yeah. that the things, I think, I paraphrase, but something like the things that might lead us out yes. are immediately seized upon. I, I think what you're talking about is any kind of experience beyond the left brain is immediately seized upon by the left brain and brought back into... Yes. Um, could, could you describe that? Because that also sounds yeah. a lot like the definition of postmodernism, um, which is that it, is. that it takes the surface and strips out the meaning and then you're back yes. in. Yes. Even the transcendental is then taken and deconstructed and... You're absolutely right. Um, and the... There are good things in, in um, postmodernism, uh, but there are also uh, problems with it when it claims that um, because truth is complex, uh, evolving, difficult to pin down, there is no truth. I mean, once you're in that realm, you know, you can't even have a conversation because it depends on some kinds of truth. You couldn't get out of bed without it. So that's my problem with it. Although. You know, one of the things I disagree with about Jordan is he dismisses the whole thing of postmodernism, where there's rather valuable strands to it. However, your question was not really about postmodernism per se. It was about this hall of mirrors. And I think that what happens is the left hemisphere is quite good on indignant. It, um, and, and that might sound like you know, you're being very metaphorical. But... But I, you know, I have nothing against metaphors. <laughs> they are how we understand things. But it's also literally true neuropsychiatrically that people who have right hemisphere damage are in such colossal denial sometimes that it beggars belief. 
you know, and, and, and you know, I, I've talked about this before, but perhaps I'll just say it again because it's, it's an illustration that, that brings it home. Somebody can have a completely paralyzed part of their body, like the left arm, after a right hemisphere stroke, and they will absolutely deny there's anything wrong with it. And when asked to move it, they will go there without moving it. And they, they're convinced. And if you bring it round in front of them and say, now look, move that, they will say, oh, that's not my arm. That belongs to the bloke in the next bed. So it's that bad. And people you know, with right hemisphere damage, they have no clue of what it is that's wrong with them. So they get very angry and challenged when people say, actually, there's a problem here. Irritability and anger are very strong in the left hemisphere. And I think that, that I think what I was getting at in the Hall of Mirrors is several things, really. I mean, one is the, the self-referential nature of the structure of the, the, the systematic thinking, um, which is not open to, to new information. But also that the, the things that used to speak to us about something beyond, if you like to say, our normal everyday idea about the world were the natural world, art, um, religion, um, cultural wisdom handed down from generation to generation, uh, spirituality, these things, and that each of them we've either become alienated from in some way, or the ones that we haven't have been ironized and mocked and dismissed. And a point I make in the book is incidental, but it, 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 it is interesting that the left hemisphere, never subtle, tends to um, piss on things it doesn't understand. And when the communist um, revolution happened in Russia, the churches were actually literally turned into public lavatories in some cases. And then, of course, you've got uh, Marcel Duchamp literally turning art into a, a rhino. And you've got, in the 20th century, loads and loads of people whose artwork was feces. So there's something incredibly unsubtle imaginatively, but it's really like a gesture of fuck you. Uh, and I, that is the level of converse one can have with the left hemisphere. And sometimes I feel that it's the level of converse that one can have with not the brighter ones, but the less bright new atheists. The internet is full of atheistic trolls, scientistic believers that they know it all and everything else is rubbish. And this is very sad. You spoke before about, it was interesting when you mentioned Taoism, uh, because that was sort of implicit in a lot of what you were saying before when you were talking about the union of opposites yeah. and how the, the idea in Taoism is that things that seem like they're opposites are actually two parts of a composite whole. And I think in the Jordan Peterson interview, you also talked about how that's the Hegelian perspective as well, exactly. that there is a greater synthesis that, that incorporates two things that are seen as, as opposites. Yeah, that's right. Um, can you talk a bit about Taoism and how that maps on to what your, to your, yes, you know, well, your view, um, your work? I, I'm not the only person to have read in their early 20s uh, Alan Watts's uh, Tao of the Watercourse Way. And that was an eye-opening experience for me because, again, I thought, oh gosh, the, this resonates enormously with my experience of the world, and yet it's not what I was taught at, uh, at school. And I actually left, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting that um, the, the contemporary view by, by, by reductionists is that um, you wouldn't believe any of these weird things if, they, if you hadn't been indoctrinated in them. But in fact, my indoctrination was very much in the rationalist tradition. But I left school believing certain things that since then I found arguments in sophisticated philosophers and evidence in science that they may well be true. But I couldn't have known that at that stage. And they were that the parts are not the same as the whole. The sum of the parts simply is not, whatever you say, the same as the whole. People who say, well, what is, the, what is this mystery thing that's been added in? But that's, of course, because you're already starting from the wrong point of view. So the fact of the relationship of parts to whole, the idea that the world is a responsive thing, that experience responds to you uh, and you respond to it. It's not a one-way process. Um, you know, m many others of these things, that the, the embodiment of ideas is as important as, um, you know, that the context changes them, that making things implicit suddenly changes them to something else. 
So all those ideas I intuitively espoused. And then I came across Taoism, which says things like the Tao that can be named is not... In fact, that's the start of the Tao Te Ching. The, the Tao that can be named is not the real Tao, which is you know, exactly what I had been intuiting, that once you've pinned it down and named it, it's no longer the same thing. And actually that is also there in the Christian tradition. For example, um, uh, St. Augustine said, if you understand it, it's not God you understand. So all of that spoke to me, but also what spoke to me was this idea of flow and movement, which I had come across because Heraclitus was legitimate in Heraclitus, who I still think is probably the most important philosopher who ever lived, even though we only have fragments of what he thought. But his thoughts are so redolent and so penetrating that I keep coming back to them. So the idea of flow that's in the watercourse way, that's in the Tao, is also in this idea of Heraclitus. It's also there in Chinese and Japanese poetry that things are like a river on which whirlpools and vortices appear and then disappear into the flow. An image I like very much, which the German philosopher Schelling took up, which is that, so, and it's a good image for me of how we relate to the stream of life as a whole, that for a while there are whirls or vortices caused by resistance and they are there and they're photographed, although they're measurable, they are material, but they are not separate from the flow of the water because they are the flow of the water and they also come out of it and go back into it. So there's no need to find a way in which this individual entity is made to cohere with the whole. So this idea of the movement of water is, you know, I can't get into all of it, but that, that runs through my book. And it's a Taoist idea. It's a Heraclitean idea. Mm. And part of the, the sense, some of the, the interviews that we've done have been about the idea that there are thinkers and there are perspectives that have been left out of the sort of mainstream tradition and are really important to recapture. Uh, I think Taoism, Alan Watts is a really good one already, but... Who are the key thinkers that you think are really essential for us to kind of reintegrate into our, into our knowledge? Western ones. Yes. Yes. Um, well, what stands out for me is William James and Henri Bergson. At the beginning of the century, Bergson was the most famous philosopher in the world. And he's credited with causing the first traffic jam on Broadway because so many people wanted to come and hear him speak. And curiously, he's been sidelined since about the 30s and 40s. He's been recently rediscovered because he said things in the 1870s that have only recently been confirmed by um, quantum uh, mechanics and quantum field theory. So that is interesting. He understood the nature and the importance of time and motion, which play a big part in the last part of the book I'm currently working on. Um, and that might sound rather limited, but actually what he shows you is that a whole different view of what we are, what the cosmos is, and how we relate to it comes from re-imagining in fact, getting in touch once again with the reality of time and the reality of motion. I think one of the things we, the biggest mistakes we make is to say, well, rea uh, time is just a, 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 um, a, a, sorry, a fantasy. It's just a sort of an illusion. And actually, when we break out of whatever it is that we're in now, we'll see that time is, is not existent. It's quite possible that in a world we cannot even conceive, um, of course, then things that we cannot conceive, by definition, might occur. But in the, through everything we know about the cosmos, time is fundamental and cannot be dispensed with. So, and, and it may sound, as I say, a rather limited thing, but in, believe me, Bergson's philosophy is extraordinarily redolent. And I read a few years ago um, something called Creative Evolution, L'Evolution Créatrice, which is translated now, and it is his introduction to metaphysics and a series of other pieces, which if people want to approach Bergson, that is the place to start. Um, and 
it's very rare for me now to um, read a book and be so electrified that I can't put it down and I'm marking all the way down the page. But with this I was. So I think he is very important. I think William James is so central to much uh, thought that has been left behind, again from the same period, um, before a kind of materialism that set in in the interwar period. There were many steps backwards, you know. We made huge steps forwards in biology, um, very sophisticated thinkers, um, but between the wars a new mechanism came forth in biology. When I started writing about science in this book, I thought, well, physics and to a degree chemistry are very much on my side in terms of a philosophy of how things are. It's not atomistic, it's not mechanical, etc. And then I discovered that actually this is being said now by biologists once again, but the last time it was said was really up until the 30s and 40s. And then there was a dark age in which uh, everything was like, and, and, and we were very excited by this wonderful discovery about DNA, in thinking, oh, it's all like code in a computer and so on. Well, I can't even begin. We'd have to do another talk about that because I could talk for an hour about why organisms are not mechanisms. It is quite true that if you want to look at a tiny detail, like what's going on on this side of a membrane and the other, you can see a kind of mechanism, in other words, a chain of causation. But it simply doesn't apply to the organism as a whole. It cannot be made to. Not because we don't know enough, but intrinsically, it is not the right way to think about it. And if you doubt that, then I will, that is one thing I explain early on in the new book. And here I might say there is a very good book uh, called Everything Flows, uh, which is uh, a book of uh, essays by philosophers, biologists, chemists, physicists, um, edited by uh, uh, Dupré and published by AUP, uh, which came out in May this year, which is a very, very interesting book for people to look at.